Good afternoon and welcome to the March 5th um, Student Achievement and Di a District Instructional Performance Committee meeting. Um, we will begin on the first agenda item, which is um, agreeing to and voting on our committee work plan, which you have before you. Um, does any committee member have any questions about the work plan? Yes, I appreciate the inclusion of the uh, strategic plan goals and strategies, and as well as the calendar. Okay. Thank you. Wendy? Yeah. All right. I guess we will call the vote on this plan. Anybody want to make a motion? Don't move. Second. Approved. This is our Unanimous. 2021 um, calendar for the SAC committee, Unanim mm -hmm. unanimously agreed upon. So we will present that um, in our minutes and have it for our president um, at our next board meeting. Um, one uh, addendum I want to add to this, I know we already approved our calendar, but I just realized that I believe it's April 2nd is Good Friday. And if anybody um, is hard set on that being our day, I would I request that for April that our SAC committee happen on the 9th. Works for me. Our board member, I'll look at her calendar. That's fine. Okay. So we have agreed um, that our board meeting for April 2nd be moved to April 9th and we'll uh, do it Friday. Thank you. I appreciate it. Two or four? I mean, two. Yeah, two. Yeah, two o'clock. Okay. Right. Next is in the item. Superintendent's evaluation timeline. Right on time, Mr. McDowell, you're up. <laughs> this was put on the item as a, a ongoing conversation that we've had um, for our board member, our committee member, Lindy. Um, and I will let him uh, kind of explain how we, where we are with this, where, how do we get you in what for your work. Yeah, that's great. Thank, and thank you, Member Barish, for the, for the time and the spot on the agenda. Um, <clears throat> we've had a couple conversations um, with either the full board or the policy committee uh, about um, exploring the idea of a different timeline for the superintendent's evaluation. Um, what we've done, as I understand it, uh, the last several years is, is had the evaluation take place around March 1st or before March 1st. Um, and I had asked our general counsel uh, some questions about, you know, did, um, what's required under state law in terms of timing, what's flexible. Um, because just from my perspective, um, it seems like, gosh, it would be great if we could set the timeline up so that when we're evaluating uh, the superintendent, we have some results for the school year that we have just ended, uh, rather than having to evaluate kind of a midstream uh, like we are this year. Um, and I think got some encouraging news from uh, Dan, uh, which was that you know, really under the law, the only thing that, that we have to have to have to do uh, is give the superintendent some some notice about whether um, that superintendent's going to be basically if, if a district wants to separate from the superintendent, they have to tell the superintendent before. So that's our, our legal obligation. Um, but outside that, at least it seems like we have some kind of uh, flexibility. And so. Um, what I wanted to do today uh, is, is I've been um, trying to think about what, uh, what some kind of possible alternative timeline might look like. Um, and what I wanted to do is uh, share some loose ideas with you all today um, and ask if uh, you can um, think about uh, what you uh, like about this. A proposal uh, or what, what seems like it could be effective uh, if things don't look like it could be effective um, just share some of your responses and reactions at our next uh, SAC meeting in a month um, and so what I'm, what I'm going to do now um, is just outline I think um, what the loose idea could be with the idea you all we certainly talked about or asked questions about today but I think my, my big request would be people just think about it between this meeting and next meeting uh, and talk about it. 
Um, and I think one, one key piece of this, and this, this might go to Deputy Superintendent a lot, was um, <clears throat> I think it could be helpful for us to know um, when different assessment data comes back to us. I, I know from the calendar you shared when we give different assessments, um, but, but I think as we'll see, like part of part of what might make this work or not work will determine on when we get information. Um, so, you know, remember Bolton, I appreciated your advice on this. Have I screwed anything up so far? Oh, not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, um, I'm sure I will screw something up quickly, but, but I'll just We all going. do. Um, so the, the, the loose idea here has four parts to it. Um, and so, so the first idea would be st somewhere around August 1st, question mark. Um, the superintendent proposed a set of measurable goals to the board for the upcoming school year, and the board shares some feedback. Uh, that's part one. Part two, um, somewhere around September 1st, question mark. Um, the board approves the superintendent's goals with any revisions offered either by her or by the board. Did you see September? Uh, mm -hmm. Question mark. Yeah, so, so it, it, part, of, part of what I wanted to get people thinking about is like, uh, how could, is, this, is this look right? Is something off? Could we make it better? Um, so you know, the, the proposal from the superintendent, chance for feedback, then the board would, would approve that with revisions, uh, either from her the board. And then um, in quotes, mid-year, um, and, and this would really depend, I think, from, from the deputy, like what feels good instructionally, um, and like when we get different assessment data back, but something mid-year. The superintendent provides a mid-year update um, on progress against those goals, and uh, so that we're, we're in compliance with statute, the board provide an update on her employment staff. So that would happen around that mid-year update time. And again, date flexible depending on what you all like, think, recommend. Uh, and then somewhere around July 1st, question mark, or is there a better date, um, the board completes the superintendent's evaluation based at least in part on final progress against those goals that were set earlier. I do have a question, so I want to make sure I you the correct information. Um, the evaluation, which test are you talking? We get a lot of assessment, so I think it would be up. The the the, the, the picture I'll ask, you know, uh, member Bolton or member Bowers if you if you describe. But I think it would it would um, you know be what the superintendent recommends. You know, okay. and so I I know that puts a hard like when when I ask I'm asking well, like when the test results come in. You know, that could be any of it, like how to narrow that. I think it's whatever the um, whatever the likely things are that a superintendent. And is it okay? Because I'm just thinking in my head, like graduation. But is that you know, it's not sure. Sure. Yes. No, but that's a but it's that. a culmination of our, our work as a, a district. I think it's a great example. Okay. So, like, it, it, when 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 in the year do we know what our graduation rate is? It's point. actually <laughs> in the fall. Right. It's in the fall because it's a year mm -hmm. behind. So we uh -huh. look at summer school uh, graduation that all goes in. It doesn't align yeah. with um, spring testing when we get the results in the summer. So we get spring testing results in the summer. Yeah. We get graduation in the fall. Yeah. And so that, I think this is an area where uh, I would love to hear what you all think would make sense. Because I think that, that it will probably be um, uh, a, a series of um, trade-offs from things that uh, can't do everything perfectly. Um, but I can imagine a world where um, that would make us want to do the evaluation in September. Or I can imagine a world where we want to talk about our graduation rates, in September, but we want to do an evaluation in July. Maybe have map data, for example. And I don't think there's one right way to do it. Part of why I wanted to ask for your help was uh, what do you think would be the best, best possible way to do it? I would definitely refer to our superintendent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think, I think <laughs> good answer. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to clarify. Spring map data is, is in the summer, but there's also some data of uh, map data in the summer. We yeah. also, so for map, we, we get it three times a year. Mm -hmm. uh, so we get it fall, winter, and spring. That's, that's math. Uh, third grade 
is the fall, we get it in the winter, but then the rest of the spring assessments, which, which is all the high school assessments and all of the state air assessment, we give it in the spring, we get it the results in the summer. Graduation, it doesn't fall evenly, nicely. Yeah. Um, and then graduation rates, we get like October. Right. I, think yeah. that's right. I remember that. Okay, I don't know why I thought there was a testing done in a, for third grade over the summer. Well, that's for third grade guarantee. We right. In the spring, we give it in. We give it three times a year. So fall, everyone. Spring, mm -hmm. everyone. And then the summer as needed. Okay. All right. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, committee member. Yeah. Barbara. Thank you. I'm sure. Um, I think uh, the first request that the uh, member would be brought to would be. It would be good, especially now since the committee's name talks about district instructional performance as well as student achievement. It might not be bad just generically for the committee and the board from our minutes to actually see what that that timeline of assessment or measurements. I think you're right. The graduation is an assessment, but boy, that's important. That's the big one. So, right. or one of the big ones. So, it'd be really good just to see that generically and. And you're right. I mean, y'all can give advice and help us help us understand this. But there's only one person in the <laughs> world that will tell us what right. uh, what we're going to be doing and what would best suit uh, the, the process. So, but I, 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 you know, as some of you may know, I've been kind of resistant to this. Uh, and and I appreciate Mr. Lindy um, uh, help, helping me through this as to some of the reasoning. And I don't think he fully appreciated all the frustration that we've all had about how that calendar of assessment and achievement doesn't coordinate very well with a HR kind of arrangement as we went things done. But this suggestion I think is good in that, and Paul, I think you would testify to this that that March date it is Ohio Revised Code, but it doesn't have to be an evaluation as much as it has to be. An employment status so that matches with both our policy and the law because you can't just say we like her or we don't like him there has to be something that has to be able to be said there if you're going to be determining status so that date sort of matches mm -hmm. with what's required and then I know our own policy says that the superintendent has to come to us with her goals uh, prior to the academic year so that August piece mm -hmm. so we're finding some consensus and compromise of between us and among us as to what to work. So I, I think this this fits, especially if we can connect it to the assessment and the evaluation pieces. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And then come back and talk to us. But after you've spoken with the superintendent, she says, well, this is what we're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just, that's it between the board and her, that's it. But we need your expertise about the assessment and exactly. evaluation mm -hmm. data. So is that where we're going? Yeah, let's we're say they have, I think my, my, yeah. my win for me today was just that the, um, people That's felt separation. clear on yes. what we were trying to ask for help with. And if you had questions on the front end so that we could make that easier, I'd be delighted to help. But maybe that everybody's good. Any other questions, comments, Paul? Okay. Um, would there be an opportunity that, I, I know you mentioned, kind of more discussion next month? Yeah, um, and provided that uh, our superintendent could be here next month, I, 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 my thought would just be making sure that, that we're sharing that and getting ideas from her as well. Cool. That sounds great. Could, could we Maybe run we'll like the? Um, yeah, go ahead. No, I can have a solution. Uh, I was yeah, I was thinking could we do that and get the information about the assessment uh -huh. now and next yeah. month that way mm -hmm. when we're together we could do that. Yes, great. Thank you. All right, moving on. Anti-racism curricular adoption, and on the top on the our calendar it says world languages, but is that all inclusive? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so we have curriculum department representatives here, Dave and Emily's on screen. Um, we have the PowerPoint up, and we will get started. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you, um, Student Achievement and District Instructional Performance Committee. Um, we're excited to be here today, next slide please, Rob, to talk about um, the work that we are doing 
um, to build an equitable and anti-racist um, system in curriculum and instruction. And so what you see here is our KDD, which is our overall theory of change. Um, it is guided by our work to be an anti-racist community through education and awareness, providing a safe space for courageous conversations and identifying racist policies, practices, and ideas, then using interventions and strategies to disrupt the system and provide equity and access for every student. We're gonna, what you see in the middle is what we believe um, needs to be in place to reach um, the ideal equitable, equitable and anti-racist system. Um, those are the key conditions. What we're gonna zoom in um, and talk about today is the work that our social studies team is leading in collaboration with um, our social studies council. So joining me today is Dave Traubert in the room and um, Craig Rush, our social studies chair. He is um, at Clark Montessori zooming in today. Great. Okay, next slide, please, Rob. Thank you. Um, we presented back in the fall to the board about a lot of the work we're excited about with our curriculum in social studies to look at the um, what we're teaching, what we're missing. Um, but we can do all the work we want to as the adults in the room, but unless we hear from our constituents, we won't know whether we're on the right track. So we listened very carefully on Monday when the students' uh, groups addressed the board and really tried to align what we're already doing with what we heard. So real briefly, what we heard was that uh, we need to have black history and diverse voices, not just in February. And that aligns with the work we've been doing to audit our K-12 curriculum to ensure that these, these things are there throughout the year. We heard that um, we need an African-American history course offered in every school and that it should be a required course. Um, that is well underway and we'll give you an update on that today as well. We are exploring the process for adding requirements to graduation requirements. Um, voter registration or participation in democracy. Um, just yesterday, matter of fact, we sent to every teacher, every high school teacher, government teacher, counselor, um, and community outreach coordinator, a list of all the students that will be 18 by um, the election with instructions on how to register them by the primary, to be eligible to vote the primary. Uh, and then we need anti-racist professional learning for teachers. Um, and that is something we have as an ongoing goal as well. So we, we think that what we're doing is definitely in alignment with what the students have asked for. So today I'm going to update you quickly on, go ahead, Robbie, please. Um, the K-12 audit, uh, the adoption of the book stamped by our curriculum, uh, by our curriculum department, and then um, the update on the African-American history course that is in development. Thanks, Rob. Go ahead. Um, we have been looking at our K-12 curriculum, and it's important to know that we can put whatever we want in the curriculum guides. We can put all the resources out there and say students need to know this, but we need to make sure the teachers are comfortable and ready to do the instruction. So there's not just a curriculum change, which is kind of what's in the orange box, but there's a culture change. We learned this year that teachers are in various places of readiness to address some of these more uh, potentially difficult uh, issues. Um, so we not only need to have the resources available, but we need to make sure that teachers have access to them and that they are ready to, to address it as anti-racist educators, with the result being justice for our students in what they're being taught and in the experience they're having in the classroom. Um, so back in August, uh, you might remember, we started off with, uh, we piloted a entire unit on social justice and anti-racism based on the uh, George Floyd protest last summer. We learned a lot from that experience. We think it was very successful, but we know how we can improve from that. We spent the biggest part of this year reviewing our curriculum, trying to find resources and say, what do you, yes? I, it, yeah. I so sorry to interrupt you. I, I don't think we have a copy of this and I just can't read it from that far away. Oh, I, Is it possible that everybody can email it out? I just, it looks great and I want to follow along. Absolutely. I didn't see it on board docs. So I don't you know if it's it. Copy it no, 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 no. You keep it, yeah. I can share a copy right now. Awesome, okay. thank you. I just, yeah, solely for the purposes of following along with what seems like a great presentation. Emily, can you send out the copy so then Dave can continue, please? Yeah, Emily, would you mind doing that? Yep, yep I'm doing it right now. Thanks. So this is just kind of a timeline. Um, so we've been, our curriculum council and teachers have been reviewing our curriculum. 
looking for gaps, uh, and the gaps are, are many. We don't know everything we don't know. Um, but we're trying to add and revise them. Um, we have been now kind of trying to catalog and vet those resources and formally add them to our curriculum guides. Last month, a number of the same students you heard from a Monday night addressed our curriculum council. We had to speak out, speak up, speak out for our teachers with that group of students. And we uh, are now in the process of sort of like listening to what, uh, what they said and what we're doing. And we also, um, we got the POSIT bonus question last month on the teacher or the parent survey. And that uh, word art there kind of captures some of the main things that we heard from our parents and community members about what we need to do to, to revise our curriculum. So next month, we're gonna have the same thing, speak up, speak out, but with parents and community members, and um, then try to crosswalk the work we're doing with what we're being asked to produce. Um, the bottom left shows the question we've been using. Do our recommended texts, instructional materials, and lessons reflect as much as possible the experiences and perspectives of different cultural groups and genders? Um, it said that that response shows a three, but we don't think that we don't like I said we don't know what we don't know. Uh, there, there's always an opportunity to do better. Uh, so we hope to update our curriculum guides formally over the summer. Uh, and then finally, this is a page out of our curriculum guides. Um, the bottom section in there is lessons addressing everybody's perspective, equity, representation, and anti-racism which is a draft of where we'll house, uh, you can see a couple of specific resources and lessons that um, address gender, race, and global perspectives rather than just European and American. Craig, are you with us to talk about the book Stamped? Yes, yes. Go ahead, Rob, please. So thank you guys. Uh, so one of the things that our curriculum uh, council did this summer or hearing was we talked um, and had book studies. Uh, one was called My Grandmother's Hands, which is a, a book by Resma Manakum, which talks about how trauma can be uh, felt through black, uh, white, and blue lies. Um, it was an interesting um, read. And we also read Stamped as a group. And it's a wonderful book written by Jason Reynolds based on a book by Ibram X. Kendi, which um, talks about anti-racism and how uh, history can be seen from a perspective of, of uh, an anti-racist lens. And uh, what's awesome about this book is that it gives a different perspective and helps support our teachers and our students to learn some of the things uh, such as Dave was was saying was uh, demanded at the council meeting uh, uh, or the, excuse me at the board meeting uh, this past Monday. So uh, we asked for um, feedback from all eighth, tenth uh, grade social studies teachers. We worked along with the ELA teachers, and um, it was a resource that it was uh, widely supported unanimously within the social studies and also the ELA so, uh, curriculum councils. And as a result, we have 4,500 U.S. history books. So every eighth, tenth, and African American history student will have access to this. Um, we're also working on continuing to provide um, professional development to um, teachers um, throughout um, this, uh, throughout January and February, and also continuing through our school page so that students uh, have access to quality anti racist materials. And um, it's something that you know, we started in this process. We want to um, thank the support that that the district has given to this um, marvelous work. Thank you, Craig. And um, as a result of this, we just decided at steering committee this week that we're going to pick up a book study this spring on um, Abram X. Kennedy's next book, 400 Souls, which might be another fantastic resource for, for our classes. Um, next slide, please, Rob. I'm going to wrap up with talking about the development of our African American history curriculum and also an African American literature course. Um, Rachel McMillan is teaching, so she could not be here with us today. But Rachel has helped lead this work. Um, most of our schools have an African American history class, but there's no consistent curriculum across the district. Uh, we also have an online course, so even if it's not offered in a building, they can students can still take it if, they, if their schedule allows it. But we think it's important to have a uniform. We believe our district, uh, we our district has a message about what an African American history course should contain. So we've kicked off the year doing a teacher-led committee. In fact, it's a um, 
the request was made and it worked out that we were able to have a committee of black teachers um, do this committee work and now it's now they are bringing their results to council for um, to kind of take the next step. So the framework of the African American history class, we've heard over and over again that African American history, if we focus solely on uh, slavery and civil rights, that that does a disservice to the, to the black experience in America. So um, the ideology is that um, we're not gonna, we're not gonna, we're gonna go farther. And the next slide, Rob, if you click on, it, it talks about the five principles of um, black historical consciousness. And this is kind of be, going to be the driving course of, of where the, the course goes. And those are uh, power, oppression, um, oh, my eyes are bothering me. but also it talks about agency, resilience, and perseverance. It talks about black joy. It talks about the African-American diaspora um, and, and the experiences thus from that. And then contemporary connections and intersectionality. So there are units kind of being fleshed out to reflect those themes. Um, and again, it's a more holistic look at African American history that uh, really tries to reflect um, the American history uh, that is that is connected to Black history. So our next steps for that are um, to present sort of a framework to the board by the end of the year to say this is what we believe our class should look like, and then spend the next year um, getting resources and finding out what actual curricular resources we need. So. Um, very, very fairly, the committee said, you know, this is, if this is true equity and anti-racism, this can't be just something that you ask a couple teachers to work on in their spare time. You need to commit the same resources to it that you would anything else. So we've asked for some budget um, line items to support curriculum development, um, for some folks to do some actual deep diving into, into getting the perfect curriculum uh, resources um, as we finalize the course. So it, it looks like there's only two check marks that are on there, but we've got a really great start and the rest of the things are just kind of uh, moving the work forward. So our next steps, again, I think that uh, we need to more formally acknowledge and collaborate with the Speak Up, Speak Out group to let them know that we are on their side and we are working with them um, and see how we can collaborate. The same thing goes for parent and community groups. Uh, it's not just a curriculum audit, it's a curriculum deliberation, which is a community effort. Um, and we really want to, um, expand our professional development for anti-race instruction. So like I said, it's not just having a great resource, it's making sure our teachers are ready and, and, and able to deliver it. And then how do we know? How do we know whether it's working? So we need to figure out how we're gonna say, uh, is a student graduating from CPS better off uh, whole, holistically by what we've done because we've made these changes to our curriculum um, this year and next? So. Thank you for your support. Um, I, I know that we've heard over and over again, leadership and the board that our work is important. Um, I've told Emily a couple times this year, this is probably the, the hardest, but most challenging and most important work of my career so far. So I'm honored to be a part of it. Do any members have any questions or comments? I have, I have a bunch. I don't so you go okay. first. <laughs> um, <laughs> I do think it's hugely important. I, I know that having spent my life with teenagers, they're not going to be that happy that this, we're going to take a, a year to figure out things and then put something in place after they've left. So I'm, I totally understand it professionally and intellectually, but emotionally for those kids, they probably need to see something at, that happens uh, a little bit before. The second thing for me, I don't want to hear that most of our schools have a black history course because I can just guess which ones might not. And so I would hope that in the next budget, that kind of staffing and that kind of curriculum work would happen so that we can say all 15 or 16 of our high schools or however many we have, I keep losing track, um, have it. So they, they could, we have the online course that um, we are really selling to principals uh, this spring as they do their scheduling, so that if they don't have a, a, a teacher available to well, teach. they should have a teacher available. Yeah, so we, we do need to but make this sure This is that such that. a big priority. They Thank should you, have a and, and I totally, I, I, whatever Dave says, I kind of buy, because he has a great social yeah. <laughs> so that, and I've seen him work in all this other area, but 
No, I just think that that has to be a big priority. Thank you for that support, and I will bring it to PLT that right. it is important to invest in that, that course. Thank you. Thank and you. as we mentioned the other night to the superintendent after this, it's did a great uh, presentation and presented their demands. Um, it worries me that they still think, after all the work you all have done uh, three years ago and two years ago and what have you in the social studies curriculum, that somehow they still think that it isn't being taught. Just to read the curriculum, it's there. Not as fully as we will make it now, but I'm that, and so I'm glad you're spending time thinking about are the teachers teaching the curriculum that we adopted? And with meaning and with some authenticity. I think that's I think that's key. And I'm thrilled. I'm glad we're using Kendi so much, but I'm really thrilled too that the part of this is is not timeline post hole black history since you know Cincinnati, United States, international. This is really a lot about power, economic status, prejudice, discrimination. Well, it's, I mean, it's it really is larger than even teaching chapters of history, which you know better than I on that because you be great about curriculum. But I'm glad to see this this piece of it. I'll also reiterate, and I'll try to stop. Um, the folks in Pittsburgh are pushing hard for, and I appreciate their report back about the AP um, African American history. And the superintendent that was pushing it the hardest is gone from Pittsburgh. I don't think it was associated with that, but I do think that whatever we can do, even from the point of a board uh, chair, if we could even think about the boards uh, sending some sort of letter to the college boards wanting to join hands with the Pittsburgh people, that this should be an add to the advanced placement inventory. I mean, I, I just think that that would be a good idea. And uh, I'll um, I'll stop. But um, this, there is very little that's more important, but I am worried that we're not apparently teaching the good curriculum that we did do, which uh, frankly is the most progressive in the area among all other school districts in Hamilton County, tri-state area, probably Midwest. That's how progressive it is. And we're gonna make it even more pushing the envelope, which is great. So uh, I appreciate the work, but, and, with that. So thank you. Some of those key points I was I'm going to expand on a little bit. The question I do have, and I agree with uh, committee member Bolton about setting things into place, but some of our young people not really have an opportunity <clears throat> to be involved or even participate in being in, in a class like that. I was going to ask you what a timeline was, because I'm hearing that you said you're going to meet to speak up, speak out again. You're going to get more input from community and families. What do you see as the timeline for this? Because I anticipate I wanted it to start next school year. We, we, well, we have um, the ability to make additions to the current African American history curriculum that's out there. Uh, currently, the, the schools that teach it, they kind of have developed their own curriculum over the years uh, due to teacher expertise and, and materials that they've gathered on their own. Um, we've, um, anything that we, Come up with this spring that we like we said the, the framework of this uh course um will be ready i mean the units are kind of being like the units are already laid out the uh topics it's just that we haven't like done a curriculum adoption where we where we shop for the right text or the right uh subscriptions to do so so we can we can make um we we are already enhancing the existing course uh and trying to make it available to Many as many students as we can get in, enrolled in it um, this coming year. So even though the the final like there's no final adoption because we're always going to be trying to improve mm -hmm. it. But in terms of like budgeting and finding the right curriculum with the right resources, that would be the, the work of of the following year. We can make the enhancements and provide resources based on what we have and based on the expertise of our teachers, which is really immense. Uh, there's some great folks out there teaching uh, in our district. That we just need to um, say, well, let's let's make those lessons and those modules available um, for Schoology, so that every teacher has the same access to the, so that we're not trying to come up with our own resources or our own curriculum in a different course. 
And then um, when you mentioned that the um, curriculum, you would like to see it as part of as a graduation requirement. Mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. I agree with Board Member Bolton to the extent where she was saying making it more of an AP curriculum for the College Board. But I would like to see it more as a regular requirement, even if it's not AP, because I know like Walnut has AP African American history. But I would rather see it as a regular curriculum. Yes, and maybe I, I, not I just would too. Add. I'm just saying. Yeah, but I mean, it would be great if College Board could add it. Yeah, uh, that sure. would be wonderful. Um, and then the question I do have about the voting, I had a group approach me the other day, interested, in, and I don't think they could come to the school, but some way or another, informing or teaching kids about civics and the importance of voting for this primary. It's funny that. It was on this, but they, they just approached me. And I said, it's funny that we're going to be talking about the curriculum on Friday. So um, how would someone who's in the community, they would be glad to do so. They didn't know if they could drop all things at the school. That I couldn't explain to them how we informed our, our children about voting if they're turning 18 right now. I didn't know how that worked. If there's folks in the community that want to collaborate with us, they can, they can contact me and, and Craig. Okay. And we'll put the, we'll put the ball in motion. In fact, Craig just met with the author of children's book, who's a CPS grad, who wrote a children's book on voting, okay. and um, he's super excited to. Uh, Craig, you want to give like a ten second or thirty seconds? Yes, his name's Christian Y. Smith. He's a graduate of CPS. He was third in the Fulton County District Attorney's race, um, and he wants to give back. So he's uh, going to come to our curriculum council in April. Talk to. Um, some of our teachers, he's willing to read the book and even purchase it for some of our kids. So we're trying our best to teach the kids throughout all levels the importance of, of voting and being in, engaged in their community. So if someone wanted that information, could I just direct them to you, Craig? That would be awesome. Yeah, we're we're in the process of really also trying to reach out to some of the mayoral candidates, even to let the kids hear because even if kids are 17 and they turn 18 by November, they can uh, vote in the primary. Uh, so that that's exciting uh, for for many of our senior students. Okay, thank you. In addition, yeah, just to add okay. right onto that, yeah, we once had a scandal called Greater Gate, <clears throat> and it was a scandal. A scandal yes. <laughs> It was called Greater Gate because we actually were having kids during the school day go and register, and we were transporting them. And mm -hmm. I think they stopped and got Greater, so that's why it became Greater Gate. <laughs> there are limits based upon the what is it, Coast Agreement. Mm -hmm. Plus, be very careful about outside folks coming in. Mm -hmm. Like Craig does a great job bringing all kinds of political people in. Yeah, non well, mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. nonpartisan or both parties mm -hmm. there or what have you. Just be very, very careful if another community group wants to come in because the people opposing them, and as we've recently found out, there are people that oppose people voting, mm -hmm. particularly if they look a particular way. And yes. they will this. Sorry, uh, Ms. Bolden. And one of the cool things is that these days they can do it online from, from school and even from home. So as long as they have a driver's license ID and their last four digits of their social, they don't have to leave school to go do it. It's a process that takes less than 10 minutes. Just make sure all political entities, and that gets scary too, because now there's nuts out there doing this. So it's, it, as a person who spent 36 years doing civics education and you didn't graduate from the district I taught in, unless you took a full year, your senior years, because you were supposed to be a kid to a citizen, this is the most important thing we do, is get them ready, I think, mm -hmm. for that. And uh, so I trust you all, but just be careful. As old people remember the greater gate. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what it was called. That's, uh, well, that's, that's refreshing, because I was wondering about the scandal part. Okay. <laughs> so my last point uh, before, and do you have, okay, my last point is when I read, you had up there African American history and African American literature. Mm -hmm. And so it, then that's something that we're beginning the framework for in our English courses. Is that what yeah. I saw? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I can speak to that. We That is a brand new course that we're introducing um, next year um, that we haven't had previously. And our English um, manager, Lanisha Simmons, and our English chair, um, Dr. Christine Gibson, are working on that. Okay, great. I'd like to hear more from that also. Committee member Lindy. Uh, thanks, Professor. 
Um, I think I wanted to start with a quick apology because I'd be a, um, I'm just not as good as I'd like to be with board docs and it was in there. I want to say I did look for it, I just didn't look in the right spot. So it was like high on effort, I just didn't actually get the outcome. So thank you for the copy. Um, I appreciate it. I have one question. Um, there's a slide that has a graph in it. Um, I think it's slide five. And it just says one, two, three, four at the bottom. You may have said this in the presentation, and I just missed it. But what are those different categories? Um, this is the we we at every council meeting and every PD we've done this year, we put this Google form out to the teachers that are in attendance, and all I ask them to do is I say take 10 minutes to look at your curriculum guide and what you're teaching right now, uh -huh. and evaluate it based on this question, which says. Um, the recommended text, instructional materials, and lessons reflect the greatest possible cult diversity of cultural groups uh, and genders and perspectives. So it's a kind of a self-evaluation tool to see where we find it. And as we do with everything we do with quality improvement, we learn as we go um, that this might not be the most reliable question because um, if there's if, if teachers only know what they were taught in college or in their own experiences. They don't know everything, so they might be like, yeah, we're, we're doing a great job. When clearly we hear from the students that we're not doing a great job. So it's the idea like one is like not at all, yes. and four is mm -hmm. everywhere, and yes. two and three are in the middle? Yeah. Okay, Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then I think um, I just wanted to echo, uh, I think, my, my fellow board members' interest in this graduation requirement idea. Mm -hmm. um, the people here may have seen this already, but there was a really interesting, uh, I think it was in San Francisco, graduation requirement around an ethnic studies uh, course. Um, and there was some interesting, uh, very recent research, as I understand it, um, showing that it, it, it uh, caused a significant and meaningful increase. Your graduation rates or GPA or attendance or maybe one, maybe all three. But it just, it just, this feels like one of those things that is not only like, does it feel like the right thing to do, and there happens to be some great research on it. Um, and I recognize that ethnic studies and African American studies have some things in common, but are also totally different. Um, but I just think this idea that like this could be a good thing um, uh, uh, is something I want to share myself. Yes, ma'am. Real quick on the racism piece, I think across well, I'll say this: social studies bears usually the burden of trying to right wrongs. And we should, because we're wonderful, wonderful people, and maybe prepared to do so or try to, but this anti-racism effort of ours needs to be in the health curriculum. Mm -hmm. so the English folks, I'm so thrilled Director Campbell is going to be having uh, this emphasis too in the English because the, what I hear from the two, my two teenage sources about this, the social studies, of course, they probably tell me that, the social studies is doing better. We hear a little bit here and here, but we don't do a lot in English. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a that's a that's a first sort of test, and, and we then do, also we do was, another thirty minutes on on the other stuff. That's going oh yeah, on in the <laughs> and, and but I'll tell you, and everything uh, exactly in the economics courses that we teach, whether it's a more general effort or it's the AP. Again, that's where racism needs to be taught too. Absolutely, is in the institutional racism economically. I'm so excited um, as uh, we move on to the next um, statement. As a graduate of two historical black colleges, humanities class was my best course <laughs> and it was required, and I loved it. We moving from a, a situation where I had a lot of, um, uh, I guess, racist kind of interactions prior to going to college, but the humanities class, and when I saw the literature, I'm thinking that's going to be fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited about that, but I agree with you. Um, Committee member Bolton that um, it should be across all curriculum. Oh, as we move on, IB courses. Let's see. Yeah. Hello, uh, back, back before I get way. started, I just want to um, acknowledge Craig. Uh, he's over sitting there, I think. He uh, did a national presentation today on citizenship at Montessori School. So, good job, Craig. Well done. Um, and thank you to the committee. I'm so excited about this work. It's a really nice segue into what we're hoping to accomplish on the website. Um, through looking at um, the IB curriculum through a social justice lens or the IB program. So I've prepared a one sheet for you that is really cute. It's from Jeff. 
and then some uh, complementary materials. Is everybody able to access those? Okay, great. So really this is just sort of an extension from our presentation on the West Side Expansion several weeks ago, a few more details, and then really it's open to you all for questions. Um, I wanted to share what is International Baccalaureate, especially because um, International Baccalaureate has been around for over 50 years, and it is often strongly associated with one of four programs that they offer. And what we're hoping to do at CPS is to broaden that and to open it up to all four programs that they offer. So um, originally it was a way to provide a global standard of excellence across lots of different kinds of schools and lots of different kinds of countries. So that might have looked like diplomats kids who had to move from country to country to country or military kids who had to move from country to country to country. But it's really um, evolved since then. Um, I just put a couple thoughts, uh, figures out 1.4 million students in over 5,400 schools right now are participating in IV education. It is obviously therefore an international and a global phenomenon. It has a huge footprint in the Americas and particularly so in Latin America, which I think is something that's important to keep in mind as we uh, explore how this is a really good match for these two schools, Roberts and Gator. Um, IB does have uh, a nice research stream. There's tons of kids in it. They do have a research arm. I gave you a, um, a little white paper on some of the key findings, um, but in general, it's, it's good for kids. And so you can see that at the earliest primary levels, as well as the sort of traditional, what we consider the diploma program. So our long-term goal, and maybe it's aspirational, but I think it's also doable, would be to have Robert and Dater serve as um, a pre-K through 12 community for International Baccalaureate. So there are four different programs, like I said. The diploma program is a traditional, what we used to have at Withrow, when you think about, it's like a global version of AP. So these are highly advanced courses. The students select into the courses. If they take a certain number of those in their 11th and 12th grade year, they're awarded a diploma program. They can um, use those credits to go to college internationally. They can also just use them to get into school, uh, into college at, um, in the United States. Their newest program is called the Career Related Program. It's also for 11th and 12th grade. And this is a very exciting and interesting um, take on how they've expanded their programming. Students who enroll in a career related program through IB also take two or three courses in the diploma program um, program, um, but they also blend that with career focused coursework. So rather than being the sort of traditional vocational versus college track, they both are really both with the expectation that um, the students who might select the diploma program would really kind of think I want to be a professor or I want to be a researcher. And the kids in the career program who are taking many of the same classes might think I want to be a scientist, I want to be an engineer, I want to be a linguist, something like that. So it's a little more career based. Um, in grades six through 10, which is what we have right now, that's called the middle years program, that's MIP. And those are college and career preparatory courses. Um, with a global bent, and then the pre-K through five is a primary years program. So all of these programs um, are global in nature. They, uh, they kind of train or educate students to have a global mindset, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But they're all feeding into this idea of adult, what's gonna help these kids thrive over time. One more thing that I want to point out is that all, even in the diploma program, as well as in the career program, there are two levels. And one is what they consider sort of their, what we might think of as our AA track. So it's basically at grade level with our math and English curriculum. Those are both calibrated at that level. Um, plus it gets my have a little more homework. And then there's the additional advanced honors program. 
So a student can go through the traditional diploma program and they can choose which class. If they feel like they're stronger in English, they can say, I'm going to go for the honors there, or I can take the, um, the regular diploma program, which is like our AA. So um, that's just sort of extra information there. Right now, we have all of our sixth through eighth graders at both Roberts and Dater participating in IB courses, which means that they are engaged in learning that enhances or fosters learning according to the learner profile. So that's what's on the chart right here. Um, I did make a little crosswalk for you so that you could see this, how the strategic plans call to action is really nicely aligned with the learner outcomes through International Baccalaureate. We want to sort of branch out and root down. So we want to add next year 9th grade, theater, then 10th, all the way through 12th grade. And um, right now, Roberts is exploring the primary years program, pre-K through five. And their plan to do that is to send a handful of teachers out for training in those earlier grades this spring and summer, come back, start to institute some of what they learned in the training, and then go through the process with their staff to determine um, what it would look like to go and actually formally include the PYP. So that's sort of the IB side of the house. One of the reasons why we thought IB was such a strong fit at Dater and Roberts is because they have a requirement for bilingualism, essentially. And Dater and Roberts both have large numbers of students who are either newcomers or have uh, been in this country for a while. Those students are um, learning to strengthen their own language through heritage courses and also will have the opportunity, you want to put them on a direct track to accelerate and advance this. Um, their home language as well as in English. We want to do the reverse for students who are English language speakers and accelerate their learning in a second language, either Spanish or French or German, so that those kids can then come together to learn those languages at the higher levels where they can actually be speaking and writing and communicating with each other. So I want to give props to Sarah Morales, who is our World Languages Manager. She's exceptional, she's very creative. She's worked extremely hard to imagine what essentially is a very complex world of language acquisition, bilingual acquisition, and she's figured out this way that students from LEAP and Roberts can join with students at Data so that they can all be learning two languages at high levels together. So that's what these three pathways map out for you. Our timeline we've already started. We created the middle years program application process last spring and summer. Um, all, uh, all Roberts and Dater uh, teachers at the middle years program have been trained through grade eight. Next year we need to continue that so that ninth and tenth grade teachers are getting training and then stay ahead of the game to provide that training for the 11th and 12th grade teachers. And then this similar work will be having, happening at Roberts. Um, IB is an accredited body or it offers accreditation so they have standards that um, are similar to other standard accreditations that we've done at the high school level. So we are planning to go through that process so that um, in the years 22 through 25, we're going to be actively engaged with International Baccalaureate to make sure that we're meeting those standards. There are some costs associated with the program. There's application and program fees, teacher training, um, and we did request uh, 3.5 FTEs so that we can expand the world language offerings so that they're available to every student at these three schools. That's for the overview. Do you have any questions? Uh, when you said so far, is there more well, coming uh, on are you? <laughs> That's I was trying to I was trying to stay with anyone. Okay. okay. So that's it. I'm okay. Okay. although yeah. I have lots of more information. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sure. Yes. No, I, I mean, it sounds like a wonderful program. Um, I, I think, um, and I don't have any, any concerns whatsoever. I think my, my, my question was going to be, um, do you have any information about uh, families at Roberts and Dater um, and what they think about IB? Yeah, so last year at Roberts, they, two years ago, they did do um, parent surveys and they reached out to parents and they also sounded, they, they were interested in that. 
This year they've done so far, I think six or seven parent information sessions because this came through very quickly uh -huh. last year when everything else in the world was sort of falling apart. And so they've been doing methodical parent engagement group and the uh, feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. Okay. Reader is also engaged in doing that. We've also done outreach to families who might be interested in choosing data through the high school lottery process. Um, so that they know kind of like what they're getting into, and that's also been provided through the feeder school. Yeah, and I just Thank you. Uh, asked Dean to do this kind of overall presentation, but I believe we're on the calendar for July. Um, and in that presentation, we're going to have the stakeholders present, so it'll be principals, teachers, and with that question, I think we should parents, the great. parents yeah. to come to the table to present during that time as well. If, if you would like to, great. It, yeah. it sounds like there's already been some great. Mm -hmm. So don't add it on my behalf. No, 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 but I think it's part of the act. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm a huge supporter of, of the program. I think it's great. Um, a couple of just more strategic things. Obviously, well, first, I want to thank the Community Learning Center people mm -hmm. who first brought this to the board's attention. Uh, some years ago about Roberts and uh, and uh, West High initially and then it became Dater and it was a way that the kids would feel more comfortable and have better uh, thank you yeah, well I appreciate it um, a lot uh, <laughs> but um, so kudos to Clicky as they're called but mm -hmm. the uh, yeah <laughs> They're always trying to think of stuff, but on the since if there's a possibility, and I think there is, that some form of what we've been for the last couple of years calling the Meridian Plan, where we have East and West in the Central Quarter, uh, it would seem to me, and there's a clicky group on the east side of town, it would seem to me this kind of, I love the idea of the kindergarten to 12th grade doing this IB stuff. I think that's so much better than the high pressure only high school mm -hmm. is stuff happening. Seems to me that you have AWL and you have ME mm -hmm. on the east side, and you have any number of the high schools on the on the east side that could then also team up. Whether that's going to be Withrow again, or whether it's Schroeder or whatever, I know we have a whole yeah Riverview. We have a bunch of folks working hard on all the career paths that are evolving. On the east and the west side, but I, I think I think whatever is offered on the west, from a from an equity standpoint, needs to be offered on the east too. And with those two great feeder schools, for the same reason, that might be something. And then the issue would be the high school itself. The the um, well, I think I guess my other concern is somebody has to be able to do something for the matriculation of the Chevy gifted kids who have some home on the west side. And I thought that we were kind of thinking it might be data. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to make sure that all right. those things can be happening without uh, uh, anybody getting squeezed out. Would be I important. would just add with that, what we've Please. done to address that is to just looking at the courses, so now having advanced placement, what is it, the AAA courses right. at West, just, it was, it was a lack of access mm -hmm. there. So we did an audit, and so we are offering these enrichment high-level courses on the West side right now. And we right. did target Cheviot with that information yeah. for the sixth grade parents. So uh, Ms. Solomon Gray had that. We worked in a partnership with communications last year. Get a really nice set of material so that those could be sent out. Um, I heard you mention LEAP. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to figure out where they would fit into IB. Through the language piece. And so if you look on the second page here, so um, we did a special parent outreach that LEAP has its first group of sixth graders. Mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. So we got together with them and we shared with them what it means to choose a high school and um, it was really a lot of fun. So since um, students, so if you look in the MIP pathway for rising seventh grade from LEAP, so our English speaking students at LEAP will leave 
after six years of language with a proficiency level of novice high. So without getting too much in the weeds, I provided you with this chart of what all that means. Novice high is the top of the blue. That's about as far as you can get if you have a, if you have 90 minutes of instruction per week in the elementary school. Um, I chose this chart. There's lots of versions of this. This one has uh, workplace outcomes. So you can actually see in the green, the top half of the green, orange, and yellow, what kinds of career pathways and jobs students might be able to access with different levels of language proficiency. So our goal is to get all of the kids at data. This is an audacious goal <laughs> to be at the intermediate, mid, or high level by the time they leave high school, which means that they would be able to operate in two languages in professions like firefighter, utilities, installer, auto inspector, aviation, for some. So it just really broadens the world for all of these kids. And any kid who's graduating from high school who can say that I can communicate at this level in two languages is going to be in a much better position. Where it becomes um, very aligned with our social justice mission is what it does for our students who are newcomers who are coming here really with a mandate to work and to engage in the American economy so that they can send money home and so that they can drive. We're not just talking about a couple of kids, we're talking about hundreds of kids at data. And so we really feel strongly we need these kids to be able to work much more closely with their English language speaking peers, develop rich language skills together so that they are uh, frankly on a better pathway to um, finding careers that are in plain terms not going to be as exploitative as what they might be facing now. And so my what I was kidding at is um, I knew that Roberts in 2019 mm -hmm. had surveyed and sent teachers training and, and you know and all this um, information gathering to with the idea mm -hmm. and then of course this has started but the training and I'm glad that it's going back pre-k through, through fifth grade as with AP classes I'm, I'm all about rolling rigor back earlier in preparation mm -hmm. for the more advanced mm -hmm. in high school because just taking an AP is not enough to me. You gotta right. pass the course. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the whole point. So if Roberts is doing pre K rolling back to teach pre K through fifth training for teachers, is there any training at least for teachers in preparation for these kids going into seventh grade, getting ready to take IB courses? So what's happening at both Leap and Roberts, right, is now they have this research based strong curriculum in ELA and math okay. that is strongly tied to science and social studies. So they're layering on top of that language that's going to allow them to take that even further. So um, the training that they're getting, frankly, is just rise the boat for everyone, or rise the tide for all the boats. So that's a great point, though. Um, because it's not so much that we're trying to create little AP kids. Mm -hmm. who are running around. It really comes back to these learner profiles so that okay. if we have strong research-based grades level curriculum for all, which we are working really hard to do, and the kids are learning to be risk takers, communicators, inquirers, speakers, and so they are going to be able to find their pathway through. So a good inflection point for you guys to know about is that in ninth grade, the kids do a community-based project mm -hmm. and the 10th grade they do what we might think of as a capstone those will help the kids decide what pathway they want to take whether it is um what courses they want to specialize in what careers they want and i don't think that i would add um a part of this process is staff engagement mm -hmm. so we have to have conversations along with the, the parents but also the staff mm -hmm. um so that's what we're doing right now before um Spending the money and engaging right. in the official okay. IB courses. Thank you. Any more questions? Can I have them? Okay. Thank you. And on the agenda, if you can talk, there she goes. I said, I know Susan is joining us virtually. Okay. So, hi everyone. We are so excited to be here this afternoon to share with you an update around our English learner students with disabilities and our students who are gifted. So, we have Dr. Margaret Hall and Chrissy Reeves to share more information with you.
Thank you, Ms. Bunty. Um, I'm going to start off just by sharing with you guys information about students with disabilities, just an update. Um, if you can go probably to the next two slides and the next one. Thank you. All right, so this, as you can see, um, shows some trend data, trend data over the years, and you can see we have steadily increased in enrollment over the years, um, but you will see this year COVID did have an impact on us. Uh, but we do fully expect to have those numbers rise again. Um, we are very proud of the services we provide for our students and attribute that to the um, increase in enrollment that we see for our students with disabilities. Next slide. Thank you. This is just another way to show you the breakdown for students, by disab uh, students with disabilities by grade level. So you can see the percentage um, in each grade level area. Next slide. We're giving you data. So also, this is another way to look at, so students with disabilities um, through their ETR have an eligibility category. So this is, there's 14 eligibility categories. There's only th 13 listed here. The one category of deaf blind, we do not have any students um, in that category within the district, so it is not on there. But each of the categories, the definition for each one is defined by IDEA. Um, and overall, we are in alignment with state averages for the eligibility categories. Next slide. So I know some people get concerned when they think about all the specialized classrooms that, that we have. So this outlines on the left, you'll see um, the specialized classrooms that we have for our multiple disabilities, autism strides, Camelot, our hearing impaired, and our preschool. But on the right, what you will see is the majority of our students with disabilities are served in general education classrooms. All of our students are general education students first. Our goal is always for our students to have access to the same core curriculum as their peers, so, and that being their least restrictive environment. Sometimes students do require additional supports or modifications that require a more restrictive setting, and that's when we look towards specialized classrooms. Next slide, please. This is just a graphic that helps show a different way of showing how we have a full continuum of services within our building, within all of our buildings to provide services for our students with disabilities. And kudos to our principals to helping us with that. Next slide. So the um, Ohio Special Education Profile, or we like to call it our SPP, is an annual report that shows how effectively we are implementing IDEA and whether our students are benefiting from being identified as a student with a disability. So ODE has established several criteria with annual targets and we receive an annual rating for those targets. Sometimes, um, if it's needed, districts will work with the state to develop improvement plans to work on different target areas if that's needed. But just so you are aware, because of the pandemic, there was not a report issued back in 1920. So this 2021 report um, contains two years of data, um, and it has it's not totally been released in its entirety um, in April. Uh, hopefully, ODE will release phase two of the report, report which will contain some additional um, data for us. Next slide. So these are the indicators on the SPP, um, the questions they ask. So are the children with disabilities entering kindergarten ready to learn? Are children achieving at high levels? They look at math and ELA. Are youth with disabilities prepared for LERC? For, for life work and post-secondary post education. So are we meeting their transition targets as they go out um, into the world after, after high school? Um, do we implement IDEA to improve services um, for our students? Um, and then are our children receiving equitable services and supports? Next slide. So that last one, that is the essential question five. Um, that's new this year. Um, it's increased, it focuses on disproportionality in the following areas of identification for special education placement, um, least restrictive environment, discipline actions, and uh, the lower risk ratio. So next slide. It makes me very happy to say that um, since I public schools, 
receive the rating of meets requirement. Um, that is the highest rating that you can get on your SPP. Um, and just to help you understand, it's really hard to get that rating because many of the indicators are 100%. So if you miss one um, and you fall at 99%, then you don't meet that requirement. So it's 100% or anything less than that as you have not met it. So um, we also met all the indicators for disproportionality. Um, so over half of all of the urban 11 districts had disproportionality findings. So we're very pleased to say that we did meet all the indicators for disproportionality, which was the new one. Um, and then we also met the targets for reading secondary transition and early childhood transition. So next slide, please. So as we look at that too, look at this as we focus on the vital few. So just you know, we're working with our school teams to ensure that all of our students who are in cohort 2021 will graduate on time. Any of those who need additional supports, we have resources and supports um, in place to help all of our students in 2021 um, get across that stage. So um, some things we're doing is attending, um, having additional time at school, extended time after school, additional interventions built into the school schedule. For, for students, some students are coming three days or four days a week instead of two. Um, we're working with high school students to make sure they have access to all the transition opportunities. We've put stuff on uh, virtual media this year. We've also worked with um, student dining and facilities um, to provide in um, school opportunities for our students because of some of the limitations out in the community. Um, this way we're able to meet the IEP transition goals for our students preparing them for life. And I am going to turn it over to Chrissy Reeves, who's going to talk about English learners. Hello, everybody. Um, this is just a quick snapshot of um, what the English learners and the gifted students in our district are looking like right now. So if you um, take a look at the slide that is on the screen, um, we, we have a group of students that we call SLOTIES. That's the, the acronym that you see up there. Um, when students enroll in our district, the family has to indicate on their enrollment form whether they have um, a language other than English as their primary or home language. Um, and if they check those boxes, those students are identified as FLOATY students, and it is our responsibility to screen their language skills, and if needed, if they need English language supports, they are um, identified as English learners and flagged as that. So the two different numbers that you see on here show the, the red and the blue show the difference in our students who are floaty students versus those who are um, considered English learners. So the English learner population is a little bit lower, and those are the students that we get funding for but it's important to note that we are still responsible for and accountable for um, some services for our floaty students. So we always include those numbers in there so that everybody knows exactly what we're looking at. Um, because even after students are exited from services for English language, they still show up in that subgroup on our um, report card for four years after that. So we still make sure that we are meeting their needs um, with some of the same services that they would have gotten when they were English learners. So if you go to the next slide, there's going to be a lot of numbers on here. So I know that this is a lot, and we wouldn't normally like to show this many numbers on screens, um, but we're hoping that you have this in front of you and take a closer look at it on your own. It just shows um, the number of floaty students and the number of EL students um, in each of our buildings throughout the district. So if you just go through you can see some of the um, some of the buildings that have higher numbers. And what's interesting to look at these numbers, there are some definitely that stand out as higher numbers. Um, but I think that you'll see that um, compared to a few years ago, we have a much um, a much greater distribution of English learners across the district than we than we used to have, and they are seen pretty much everywhere in our district. Um, I think the next slide might be the end of the 
the end of the alphabet for English learners. There's the end of the, or yeah, for our school buildings. And then if you look at the next slide, that's going to show you how um, the percentage of students who have an LEP plan um, in each grade level. And the thing that's interesting about this and just a little telling is that the grades one and two are higher percentages. And that's pretty consistent with what we've seen is that we are getting um, younger and younger students moving in and then those numbers are, are growing as they get older. So just as a little FYI, in our buildings, some of the ways that we meet the needs of these students are through our ESOL specialists who in the buildings with larger numbers of students who are English learners, some of them um, are solely based in those buildings, but for the most part, we also have itinerant um, ESOL teachers. And then we do have what we call our SLIFE classrooms, which are for students with limited or interrupted formal education. So those are newcomers mostly to our country, and we have specialized classrooms for them to um, give them the intense supports that they need when they um, first join our school system. So if you go to the next slide, well, now a little snapshot of our gifted learners. Again, on the next couple of slides, there are some numbers um, where you can see how many gifted students we have in each of our school buildings across the district. So again, I, I wanted you to have these numbers in front of you, not necessarily to go through them on the slide, but so that you could look at them later. And um, if you go, the total number of gifted students that we have in our district is 4,050. And if you look at this, um, the, nope, that was good, the one that you were just on. The total number is 4,050. Um, and if you look at the students by grade level, you can see that the first level where um, there is a large number of them is in third grade. And that is because we begin to do whole grade screeners for gifted students in the second grade. So before that, um, we can still identify students as gifted, but they have to be referred by someone, so we just don't get a large number of them until um, those whole grade screeners that we do in second grade. Um, and the final slide just gives you an example of some of the supports that we offer our gifted students. There's a wide variety of what that could look like, um, and it can happen in any school. Um, it can happen through their gen ed teachers, through gifted intervention specialists. It just depends on the individual student situation. And what our, um, what our gifted manager would like me to remind everyone is that um, once a student is identified as gifted, they are always gifted throughout their entire academic career with us. So we wanna make sure that we're maintaining those supports for them for the entire time that they are with us. So that is just a very quick snapshot of those two groups of students, but I know that Dr. Hall and I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have about any of the students that we serve. Um, I noticed, and it's a quick notice, so I don't know that it's real, but it, it's, uh, it's obvious that in the neighborhood schools is where we see the greatest number of folks that are, you know, for the English language learners, it doesn't seem to be very distributed among our magnet schools. And I think that makes sense, but I think it also would justify additional emphasis in those neighborhood schools, even additional staffing, additional monies. I mean, that's 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 layering a lot of work in a neighborhood school that already has so many challenges. But just it's it's interesting, and, and again, that's quick. Like I don't know if that's true, but it, it, at a glance, it looked like that. For the English learners, was that the group that you focused on? Yeah. It, it it is true. There are a lot in the neighborhood schools, but there are also a lot in the schools like Ami, AWL, um, right. Leap, yeah, and Roberts. So those are those are some of the ones with the think, high numbers. If I might, I think that's I think, to keep those kinds of schools available. Too, uh, because without that, the concentration of those sort of district-wide uh, magnets for those specific purposes, let alone leading to the IB piece, you can imagine where the where the how difficult it would be for all the neighborhood schools if those kids mm -hmm. won't be, be gathered together. 
I think it also speaks to just the continued need of making sure that all our families are aware and understand the magnet lottery process for those who choose and wish to participate. I agree. I just have a couple of anything else. No, I'm good. You go ahead. Okay. I just have a couple of, of comments that I've that <clears throat> noticed. For our students with disabilities, I saw that our Camelot uh, classrooms, I thought there were more than that, which could say two things. They're not needed or we're doing better with our, our step-down uh, groups like strides. So is that because I thought we get more, more Camelot classrooms across the district besides two. No, so you're correct. So we are doing uh, much better with our step down um, for our students that are transitioning from Camelot to Strides and then from Strides back out into general education classes. So yes, we are seeing improvement with that. Okay, and then I have a question um, about the Thank Ohio you for noticing, by the way. <laughs> I'm working mental health. I know that all the time. So the Ohio SPP. Um, who who does that evaluation? Do we evaluate ourselves, or does the state come in? Or is that information from the parents? Because I'm I really would like to know how we came up with how we're doing. If we're giving self report, or is are they getting information from parents and they're coming down to evaluate? How does that work? So um, as you all know, IDB is a federal, yeah, it's a federal, um, many compliance pieces that we need to meet that level. So as part of the state of Ohio's reporting requirements to the federal government, they are obligated to evaluate each and every school district on various standards. And so as such, it's not self-reporting. It is a very rigorous process where they evaluate all of our data streams and then those um, are reported to us, but then they're also simultaneously reported as an aggregate at the state level back up to the federal government. Okay, so there's never like feedback from our customers with this. Is they're coming back with our processes? Is that how it works? For this report, we are obligated to seek parent feedback as well in a variety of ways, particularly around how we provide and allocate resources. So this year during the pandemic, we used Thought Exchange um, and had unprecedented amounts of parents who provided feedback to us. So um, that was a very helpful tool for us this year. Thank you. And one last point in inquiry. When we talk about our students with disabilities and we're talking about prepare for life, how are we preparing uh, our students for the next level? And is that measured anywhere? Do we have data on that? And I'm thinking more as far as like possibly career paths or connecting them with what's next after high school. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. I love transition. That's my that's my passion. So um, we have worked over the last um, five years and even more so um, as we've progressed on providing opportunities. So community based opportunities for our students. We've also implemented backwards planning tools at the school level for teachers to use so we can help students identify those paths, um, one of those three E's. And if it is with an employment path, then what are we doing to help them with that? That involves us, we also work with OOD or BBR, um, and then also with DDS as well for some of our students on what that employment path looks like. So we have classrooms, um, that we started this year in um, for 11th and 12th graders um, in um, our mostly from our multiple disabilities classrooms that are um, showing strong skills in employment paths and incorporating that into their academic curriculum for those employment paths um, to help them. So those are the groups that are working with food um, student dining services and with um, facilities on different projects and skills, and they use a rubric where they measure their skills. So in those classrooms right now, I'd have to go back and double check the numbers on that, but I do believe um, that we all, I, I do believe all the students, I could be off by one, are all on target to graduate okay. towards their we, employment path. And thank you, Dr. Hall. Do we know if they're going to be connected with a career mm -hmm. after that? Are we monitoring that too or no? So that is actually in the SPP. That's one of the things that's monitored is 
transition. So they do longitudinal studies every three years. This year we are doing that longitudinal study. Um, it's in conjunction with Kent State. Um, so we will get that data back. Um, but yes, we do monitor that. They divide this data up and every three years we get to do that. All right, thank you. Thanks. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yep. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, I think first I just want to say thanks for all the information uh, and I want to say congratulations on the 100% um, on the on the SPP. Um, I'm, I'm learning more about these different measures and how they work uh, and so uh, that sounds like a, a big deal. I want to say uh, congratulations. Um, I think that the thing um, uh, I'm trying. I need your help with, and I don't quite know the right way to think about it. Is you know, um, my experience has been so far. The things I tend to hear about from parents are when they're not going well, um, and I'm trying to hard to figure out how do I make sense of like one or two or however many like very clear uh, points of frustration they've had, with also trying to like not just see anecdotes, but see the whole system, you know, and like see it in an accurate and thoughtful way. And I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit to know what to do. <laughs> um, and, and I think like maybe the way, the way to get at this is, you know, um, Susan, you were, you were talking more about what we do in terms of parent feedback. Um, can, can, I just want to learn a little bit more. Can you tell me about like what, what are the kinds of things we do to see what the parent experience is like? Um, and again, like I, I promise that if I, if I uh, had a perspective that said, uh, I really think there are a million things that are wrong, I promise I would tell you. I think what I have are like some individual parents who have shared real points of frustration. And what I don't know is like whether those are individual cases or something different. And I thought that asking some questions about how we, how we listen to parents could be one way to get at that. If you have a different way, I'm also totally open. Yeah, so the beauty of student services that is it's based on individual student needs. The hard part about student services is that it's based on individual student needs. So that said, we have um, parent mentors that work with us through a state grant, and they walk alongside our families because when families request them or when we request support, um, and I think that within the structure of student services, there are student services managers who are assigned to work with a certain number of schools. Those folks go out and they meet with school teams, they meet with families on a regular basis, they sit during the IEP meetings, they sit at the evaluation meetings, and they help guide the process. Sometimes that can be incredibly overwhelming, and there are times where school teams and families disagree on what's right or not right for students. And so that's when parent mentors can come in and really help bridge that um, for families. They help um, in terms of being able to explain sometimes what is a highly technical process. So I would be um, remiss to say that everything goes splendidly well all the time. It certainly does not. I will say, however, because everyone is passionate about children. I'm a mama bear when it comes to my own child. And so people are passionate about their children. They're passionate about what children need. And that happens on both sides. And so most of the time, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, if we can get families to the table, and we've learned a lot in this COVID era about how much virtual technology has helped us. Our levels of engagement are higher than they've ever been with families, and I think Margaret and Chrissy would concur with that. I think when we are able to engage, um, we are able to really work out solid plans for students. I, I really appreciate that, Susan. Can you say just a little bit about um, like I heard you describe the uh, like parent mentors um, and, and the different ways that different mm -hmm. people uh, work with parents. Um, uh, mm -hmm. you, know, you could say that one, one of the parents I was thinking of had very specific, very positive feedback about her parent. Um, so I just want to pass that on as like a real uh, bright spot. It was very, very, very good. Um, do, do we have any form of like, um, somehow collecting feedback from parents on like how they experience the process? 
So in the past, we've done roundtable. We haven't this year because of COVID, but in the past, we've done roundtable discussions with families. We've collected surveys from families. Um, we get feedback from various um, managers when they go out and meet with families. So we have had formal and informal mechanisms. We are required to get feedback from families as part of Idea B um, in terms of the way in which we allocate and provide resources to students. Well, thank you, I appreciate it. Any more comments, questions? Okay, thank you, ladies, for a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Career Pathways, Assistant Superintendent Murphy. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I am always excited to talk about career pathways as it relates to both career-based learning and career and technical education. So today, we have both managers here, Brittany Cousins and Mike Turner, to talk to you a little bit deeper. Well, we are so happy to be here uh, today, and we're going to share some updates, accomplishments, and future plans uh, around uh, career pathways. Uh, you know, our students uh, really uh, shine all of the time, even during uh, the unprecedented times that we've been in. Uh, our uh, students have been showing up for classes online or in person uh, when, when they've been able to do that. Uh, they're still participating in many work-based learning experiences across the board, making those networking connections, uh, also looking towards their 3E pathway and, and designating that. And then uh, also not just getting those uh, very technical content skills that they need, but really gaining uh, necessary soft skills that we know are so vitally important. Uh, to help them navigate uh, not just through a job when they graduate, but also through life uh, in general. So this next slide uh, shows you some pictures, and we feel like pictures just speak uh, volumes. And so these are pictures that really show what our kids have been uh, working on. Um, in many cases, we could have shown you numerous pictures, but what we have here are some students working on the Habitat for Humanity, uh, Ryland Build in conjunction with Woodward's uh, instruction program. Uh, we've got a couple pictures of students doing various things at the Zoo Academy, uh, student working uh, in a pharmacy, and then also uh, that's through the Tri-Health Partnership, and then our DHL uh, logistics program. So we're just excited that our students have really been stepping up to the plate and looking uh, to their future. And so Brittany's going to talk about this slide, which is very specific about their future. All of those items that we shared are a direct implementation of our secondary ed team goal, which is centered on the 3E, to increase the percentage of students who are declaring that 3E pathway, moving them from 92% to 95% by the end of this school year. And we're also planning to really um, focus in on our diversity and inclusion goals by ensuring that we are closing gaps and creating strategies and programming to close those gaps for our student population groups that are traditionally <coughs> underserved. Next slide, please. So even through our broad goal, we have department-specific goals that we are honing in on. For career-based learning, we have two main objectives to ensure that our students have accessible and effective career learning experiences, as well as creating partnerships and avenues for short-term and long-term career attainment. Uh, for, for Career Tech, uh, we are, are, of course, governed by some federal uh, guidelines through the Perkins uh, legislation uh, that trickles from the U.S. Department of Education to the Ohio Department of Education, then down to us. We wrote our plan. Uh, about a year ago, uh, we had no issues with ours for Cincinnati Public. It was accepted uh, with our submission, a uh, very broad stakeholder group. Now we're in the process of, of doing what we need to do for a yearly basis. But two of the really big highlights that we just wanted to mention uh, that, that come out of this work that have a direct impact on what our students are, are doing. One is the increased pre-apprenticeship opportunities. 
with the power of the graduation requirements that ODE is, is currently uh, having us work under, if a student completes an approved pre-apprenticeship program uh, through, uh, through their either career tech, or it really doesn't even have to be career tech, but in our district, we have them approved through career tech, they literally satisfy three things. They get two options, satisfied for their alternate pathway in case they can't pass the, the uh, English and math tests uh, for in the course exams, but they, but they also get an industry credential seal automatically. And so we are uh, working very actively on increasing pre-apprenticeships. The other thing though that we really targeted in our Perkins 5 uh, goals that will govern us for the next four years uh, deal with increasing achievement and participation for underrepresented groups. So as we just heard the presentation from uh, the Department of Student Services, uh, it, it's amazing the cross-collaborative work that's occurring with career tech and uh, student services and also English language uh, learners. In fact, we've got a couple parent sessions coming up, uh, one, on a, one at night and one on a Saturday afternoon in the next couple weeks that are specifically targeted for English language learner students uh, in sixth grade as they will be making those choices for the high school of choice process. And so we've been working together. It's, a, it's been a great collaborative opportunity. Uh, the other thing that we're excited about is the classrooms that Dr. Hall mentioned for 11th and 12th graders that are mainly multiple disabilities. For the first time ever, I believe, in since I public schools, those literally are career and technical education classrooms. Even though they are heavily Department of Student Services behind the scenes, they are career tech courses. And when we uh, get out of this flat funding state that we're in, we will see a funding bump because of classrooms uh, like that. So we're just so excited uh, about that. So I'll turn it back over to, to Brittany to talk a little bit more about implementation. Absolutely. So a lot of times we get asked, what does this look like? How, do, how are you actually making this impact? So on the career-based learning side, we're still implementing advisories. So from grades 3 through 12, our students and our teachers are participating in this class every week, really focusing in on social emotional strategies, team building, as well as post-secondary exploration. And all of that helps inform students' choice for that 3E pathway. In addition, we had to move a lot of our experiences into the virtual space and so we had great success in um, starting some new ones so or capitalizing on some new concepts let's say that way um, so we've had the beyond the tassel series in the college and career space specifically though in the spring we switched gears and had the beyond the tassel career edition and that's where we've been able to pull in our partners to take students and families on a journey to not only learn about the different in-demand career fields, but also to have tangible steps that they can apply um, to job exploration, job attainment, and then working towards um, a summer internship and or um, job currently or in the future. In addition, we've been able to start some new um, opportunities, including the How I Got Here series, which is where our partners help us show not only the professional journey, but also the personal journey that we all take as we are learning and obtaining our career field. So we want students to know that it's not a clear line from A to B to get to that point, but there's going to be some challenges and some obstacles that you have to overcome to achieve that success. In addition, we're going to continue some of our traditional um, experiences including mock interviews, which will be done also in the virtual setting, utilizing the technology that is at our disposal. We are really excited though that our employment pipeline work has continued. So many districts in the city specifically have not been able to continue those work-based learning experiences that we talked about a little bit earlier. But due to the advocacy of our senior leaders as well as our partners, we've been able to continue those. So specifically the ones that we highlighted before, um, the tri health experience never stopped. And so students have been able to continue their experience. We're actually getting ready to graduate our first cohort of students that completed their two years. And so they will be graduating um, this spring with an opportunity to continue that employment as they graduate. 
So we're really excited about that. And in addition, we're working to build upon that success, include more schools and more students in those opportunities. Uh, also along with implementation, uh, we have many other uh, goals with Career Tech that relate to professional development. One of the things that I find myself saying quite often to our Career Tech teachers is if we say out your title, you are a career and technical education uh, teacher or an educator. And so there's more than just teaching the technical content. It's also the, the career-based content as well. So we do a lot of professional development. This has been a record year for professional development delivered to career and technical educators. We have broad stakeholder involvement. Brittany's going to talk a little bit later about the business advisory uh, council that, that she manages. But each one of our school-based career tech programs have advisory committees with uh, different stakeholders. And then finally, um, you know, we have myself, we have a career tech instructional coach, and then a career tech pathway specialist who really work uh, side by side and also in tandem with, with Brittany and her department to make sure that all of this implementation uh, takes place. So this next slide are just some things that we wanted to, to point out to you about uh, about what we do. The high school guide, which uh, there's a picture of the cover. If you have not had an opportunity to look at that, uh, if you have this presentation, uh, you can click on that picture and it will take you to it. The pages three and four in the high school guide give a, a clear layout of, of all of the career clusters and what career tech, career-based learning, and other things have to offer uh, in our different high schools. So we're, we're really happy the way that that's evolved. Uh, the other thing that we're really happy about with Career Tech is we only have three high schools left who do not have a Career Tech present. And so uh, next year we will be working with Schroeder, Spencer, and Walnut uh, to be able to roll that out. We've already led them through uh, with, with Naviance, our college and career planning tool, to survey their students. They're getting a good feel already for what uh, their students are interested in. One of the uh, overriding factors that we look at for expanding career tech is student interest. If there is no student interest, there should not be uh, a new program. The second issue, though, that we have to look at is if there's student interest, is there a facility <clears throat> to support that student interest? And then uh, we're happy to say that we have over 20 uh, career tech pathways and uh, 12 or 13 different career clusters, and so we are just very, very pleased that we are expanding career tech even in the midst of uh, these these times. Thank you. We can't do this work in isolation, so Mike and I have wonderful team members. We're a very small but very mighty team, <laughs> and we do great work, and so our specialists really help us um, to serve in between a capacity of a district and on the ground support, um, as well as our instructional coaches really work together to build out that curriculum, make sure it's not only meeting the qualifications for ODE, but also our business community. So we want to make sure that our students are learning the skills that are in demand from our employer partners and make sure both are in the line. In addition, we're very fortunate to have multiple layers of councils or guiding um, groups who are assisting us in making this happen. And so Mike mentioned the pathway specific advisory councils at the school level, but we both have the career tech advisory committee as well as the business advisory council that consists of both school team members, community members, and our business community, all working together <coughs> to really bring this work to life, connect opportunities to our students, and really advocate on our, our behalf. So much so, if you can go to the next slide. Our district has been recognized in multiple capacities. So I'm really excited to announce this, that um, in the inaugural awards for the Business Advisory Council, we were given two of the top awards. The first is we were rated a four-star Business Advisory Council. That is the top tier, and that just denotes that we have multiple promising practices that other districts can emulate. Secondly, we were the only district to receive the Excellence in Coordinating 
career development experiences, which was one of the top honors as well. And these were awarded to us out of 120 other districts who submitted their plan. So we are extremely excited and extremely grateful for our partners for over the past six years at this point. They have continued to break down those barriers and make the connections in tandem with us. Um, I will note that CPS was the district first who really began this work before the state mandated that districts have to have a business advisory council. You may have known them under the name of the Business Education Connectivity Council, the BECC. This work has been building over the years, and I am so happy that that group had an opportunity to be honored in such a way. Next slide. So that, that's hard news to follow. That's, a, that's some great news there. Uh, some other programmatic celebrations that we have is um, strategic plan. We did meet both of the goals uh, last year. In fact, exceeded those goals by a pretty good amount uh, that dealt directly with industry <coughs> points and then numbers of students who had 12 points in the same pathway. Obviously, work-based learning is a huge celebration. We talked about those partnerships today. Uh, we've added uh, we've added opportunities both in the in the career space, but also in the career tech side. Uh, we've not pulled anything back. We've we've been adding. We also are adding more pathway expansions for next school year in new programs that started this year. And then we've been able to navigate through COVID uh, nineteen, which uh, we always will take that as a celebration. Uh, some pictures before. Uh, I turn this over to Brittany to, to talk about some next steps is, you know, you see before you a picture of some students and some firefighting um, outfitting, and that was donated by the uh, Cincinnati Fire Department. Uh, we have to fresh, and so this year we have a, a really good number of about 120 10th graders in the foundations course. And we know that what naturally will occur for next school year, is some of those 10th graders will decide firefighting is not for me, we're okay with that. But we have a really good group of students who can build now into the future next year as 11th graders. And so we will be adding an additional teacher at West High to be able to accommodate that program uh, growth. You see a picture of the Woodward van now. Uh, you know, Miss Miss uh, Murphy over there had a lot to do with that Woodward van, but that but now teachers are actually being trained to drive that van. And Rick Pridemore, who's our instructional coach for Tech, and just happens to be a certified trainer for, for for this, and so he's providing that training. It's no cost to the district, but our our goal, uh, and it takes you know some monetary uh, to work to do this, is we need more of those. We need more in-house transportation that can take these small segments of students to work-based learning and you don't have to pay the expense or go through scheduling. Uh, and then of course, you see a picture there uh, in the bottom corner of a, of a very beautiful looking tri-health group. And that's a great accomplishment because not only are those students uh, doing what they do with tri-health, through, through Brittany's work and then what happens to them beyond, but they're also going to get pre-apprenticeship status with that as well through career tech. And so those are a lot of our uh, celebrations. What we're going to also be doing next year before I turn this over to Brittany, not only will we have the public safety addition uh, of a teacher at West High, we're also, we started uh, at, at Aiken this year, we started a new agriculture program, a new education program, and so those will both be expanding. So we'll be adding an agriculture teacher and an education teacher. Uh, Ms. Bolton, I wore my purple just for you today. Uh, you saw me in the hallway. You said I look good. And a little bit later, a little bit later, I And then also at Woodward, we are updating the advanced manufacturing uh, piece of Woodward. We know that programs have to be updated periodically, advanced manufacturing changes. So uh, we are putting some, through our Perkins federal funding, some capital improvements into equipment, uh, and then adding back a career search model at Woodward that took a brief pause 
uh, so that we have a full complement there for students to be able to choose which one of these pathways am I going into at a school that has several. And so we're excited about all of that. And Brittany is going to end up with some exciting uh, future endeavors as well. Absolutely. So as we look ahead, um, we want to continue this success, but we also want to continue to build the infrastructure so that our district can continuously be sought after as a district of destination. So in our next phase, we'll be focusing on two areas. Mike kind of touched on one of them, which is expanding those pathways, making sure that um, our students have the access that they need, as well as we're keeping current with the demands of our region. But secondly, our superintendent has laid out a vision um, multiple times of a space where our students can really dive deep on this work, as well as the work of our college. Um, team member and really focus in on their post-secondary pursuits. So we're envisioning a, a true building to be able to do this. We wanted to be able to start this work now. So if you can go to the next stage, we're really going to um, begin this work next school year with the CPS College and Career Center. And if you go to the next slide. We are looking to start this opportunity here at the Ed Center and really work to address some of the most pressing barriers for our students in that post-secondary space. There's three main ones. The first is um, lack of concentrated one-to-one -one support. Um, the second is um, navigating these complex systems in the college and the career space, as well as really obtaining those necessary resources for success. So we are creating a one-stop center for students to get those needs addressed. The first will be an opportunity for students to work with a college or a career coach to be able to have one-to-one -one, um, individualized support. <clears throat> we know our counselors do tremendous work in our district, but their capacity could be limited to be able to provide that level of concentrated support. So students will have an access point within this center to be able to meet and uh, refine that personalized goal and actually have someone walk them through all of the pieces. Secondly, as we look at um, the college space, for instance, with the FAFSA completion, as well as the financial aid navigation, those coaches will be able to assist in that effort by really utilizing those councils that I mentioned earlier. So we have a robust network in the college consortium space. How do we maximize that support? New in the career space, however, um, we have seen countless times how our students um, have issues in obtaining some of those necessary documents, birth certificates, social security cards, ID cards. Um, we really want to provide a more succinct way for our students, especially in that 16 to 24 age range, to be able to access those items. So we want to partner effectively um, with those governmental agencies to figure out a way in which we can navigate this space. And last but not least, we want to leverage the support of our alumni councils at our schools who are very active and eager to support um, to be able to ensure that our students have access to those resources. So transportation support, dorm room essentials, workwear requirements, things in that. We don't want to have a closet. We want to be able to, <laughs> yes, that's a lot, a lot of work. We want to be able to give them vouchers or connect to where they can um, access those materials. So we're really excited to begin this work. Um, and thank you to the support of our senior leaders to be able to begin this process. And we know that this will be a central space to help with all of the work that we talked about before and push us to that next stage. So I think that's all that we have to share and we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Most of the people in this room know how much I care about this whole career piece and have for a number of years. Um, one quick thing, and the Student Achievement Committee can take credit for this. This district for almost 20 years, even though the state required business, uh, what's it called, put business, business advisory. advisory, for 20 years, we, we didn't have one. Mm -hmm. Because we thought the CBC telling us what to do or not do counted. Mm -hmm. Then we <laughs> made sure, we made <laughs> We made sure that no, we we are required by law to have this in these other districts, and see, it's not five years, and we're the best. <laughs> I mean, that's remarkable. I think that was fantastic. I, I get great pleasure.
I also get great pleasure out of that Woodward man. <laughs> 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 I remember when that it popped up as an idea, which she said, well, but my students can't get yeah, there. Yeah, I remember. Uh, <laughs> so it's it's great. Hilarious. But this is good. I had a, a, a little, I won't say concern, but on the one stop, college, one stop, that uh, I think that's great. But also I can remember way back in college years when you got into that junior, senior uh, uh, level uh, in college, there was in a student union a placement office. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I, I wouldn't I wouldn't think that it might not be a bad idea to include placement uh, as well as the one stop because as it, when you talk in terms of, of internships or careers and, and you know, even college placement. I mean I know we've got wonderful counselors everywhere, but I, I just just the word placement is like somebody's going to be getting that happening for you. This is great report. I, I have one inquiry about the um, here at the Career College and Career Centers. I know that many or most high schools have the college and career person work with their counselor. Is that going to be removed from the schools and this is just going to be the one place or is this an addition? It's an addition. Okay, good. Very yeah, good. It's an addition. Yeah, and actually, most schools have a college person working with a school counselor, right. but yes. they do not have a career person. Okay. Okay. So that's one of our big visions too. Is we feel like, I'm thinking college we feel like there needs to be a career specialist yeah. at every high school as well, or at least shared yeah, at a couple high good. schools okay. to help meet that need. So I am very excited this is great news it's wonderful and i know that we are doing all these great things but as i was talking to assistant superintendent Murphy before we started how come we can't get this out in the community more well i've been taking all kinds of notes yeah well, so, <laughs> i am so, so sick of people saying we need to have okay we and then um assistant superintendent Murphy explained career tech is the terminology and it's not just vocational and i right. like to hear you say we can't just have vocational without teaching the career part of it, right, right? right? And I think that that's fantastic, but the publicity and the information yeah. in the community, that we're doing fantastic things in this area. I'm but so nobody excited. knows that. I'm so excited to talk about it. This yeah. is the best meeting I've ever <laughs> I was saying to uh, our chair um, before the meeting started, and help me, Mike and Brittany, I think it's accurate. The only areas that the Oaks has, just because that's what people mm -hmm. think, that we don't at this time, Cosmetology, automotive. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it. I know we have cybersecurity stuff going on too. I mean, we. Right. I know all of these things, but when some people have called me and said, "We need this," and can't, we can't need this. I said, yeah. "We have all these things, but nobody knows." So well, and it's funny. Right before this meeting, I was in a meeting with uh, uh, Rob over here and and uh, Liz Wolf with uh, and Josh Harden and uh, somebody from. Uh, early childhood about the CPS TV. And so how can, so the whole point of that meeting was, how can we get some other things like what we're talking mm -hmm. about onto CP, CPS TV? So we came up with some good plans with that. We also have a videographer who we've contracted with who is literally, maybe may even be filming literally as we're speaking today, uh, putting together videos about what we do so that we can get that out there. We're also updating the website. The website for Career Tech, at least, was taken down before me because it, it simply, I guess, was out of date. And when I got this job, I was looking for all kinds of information. I couldn't find it. And I'm like, this got to be fixed. And so we're updating that. So we're definitely making inroads to that because I completely uh, feel what you're saying. Mm -hmm. People just don't know. And then it's getting people to understand what 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 is career and technical education versus vocation. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. some schools are still called joint vocational yes, schools. They are. But we don't use the word vocational for what we do, even though you know it and is vocational, it, but it we might, don't use the word. It's, it's career, and I think um, marketing wise, uh, when we think of career tech, everybody thinks of Woodward. It's the only school where yeah. there's a career tech right. opportunity, and it's not, but it's in the name. Right. And so I think marketing was we got to think about that when we start talking. I know about the DHL connection. I know about um, the health with with uh, Tri Health, but it's not really known, and it's not really seen in the community as 
is that we're providing that. So we need to probably think about There's going to be a chance if indeed the superintendent and the leadership team uh, buy what I think some board members are going to be saying about old shore, new shore. Oh, great. That mm -hmm. I think one of the huge things besides this concurrent learning with the, the digital and the in, in person, which will be a tremendous marketing piece, I think that this whole expansion of mm -hmm. career tech and you actually have a map <laughs> of our district mm -hmm. and you click on at every place and, and Murphy has heard me say this again and again, even if they're not, we call each of our schools home campuses for mm -hmm. that particular career. Right. Right. And using distance learning, this is the rub. Nothing's more important in Cincinnati than I mean, it's just that's you identify yourself. It's like which parents, right. it's which high school you went to. My point is when to get the people to begin to select high schools based on which career path. That's seven or eight years down the line, unless we also say with distance learning, mm -hmm. you can have a home campus for ROTC, but you can have multiple, just like, you know, you're talking about the firefighters or whatever. Right. And then if we get this superintendent once, which is an actual training center as well, where you could actually have groups and mm -hmm. get transferred. I'm just saying you have to, you have the, a home campus and what's at each place, and that other kids could access it, I just think then, then that is huge. Yeah, and a, and a district that does just what you're talking about, and I went and visited this uh, with a member of one of the student services managers right before the pandemic, shut everything down. We went to Akron and Toledo. So Akron Public Schools literally does exactly what you're talking about. They have hubs, their transportation centers around those hubs, and in the middle of the day, Right. Kids leave a school, get on a bus, and go to another school because they're going every every school in their district is a career center for something. Mm -hmm. And you go to your, your home school either at the beginning of the day or, or the middle of the day and you switch in the middle. And it was amazing what they did, but their entire district is built on that. But we learned a lot about how to integrate uh, student services and career tech from Akron, but also Toledo. Toledo's a lot more like us, the way mm -hmm. that we deliver uh, career services than Akron, but Akron is the model that you're talking about, yep. literally. So, I mean, we need to do it. We do need to do it. Yeah. I just wanted to share, uh, what we added this year uh, is an early childhood development credential, mm -hmm. yeah. and that is at Aiken, at mm -hmm. Taft, at Virtual, well, we got one on Virtual, <laughs> and, um, Oiler. 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 Oiler also uh, added media arts. Yes. Mm. They started a student podcast. Amazing. Yeah. Um, the agriculture was added at Aiken as and well. And education. Right. And education. Right. Um, so next year, in addition to the uh, junior ROTC, we'll be at Aiken um, High School. And then there's a few other things we're adding. And oh, Brittany's team is talking about expanding Belcan. Uh, right now, so this is just um, what they're talking about. Walnut is talking about an engineering course. Spencer is talking about a engineering or IT. Or possibly IT. Engineering yeah. or IT. And uh, Schroeder is talking about more healthcare. They do have a senior only farm pharmacy tech, but mm -hmm. we want a whole pathway there. And then I want you to know that there were 90 Cincinnati Public School students who applied for the fire cadets. And then Brittany is working with Officer Hawkins on the police cadet. So good stuff coming. Very and one of the things we're going to look at with fire cadet is for the students who get into the fire cadet program, where do they go to high school in our city? Mm -hmm. and, and what if they're going to be in 11th grader next year and they don't go to West Side? How would there be a way to get them, if they're a TAF kid and mm -hmm. they want to do firefighting as 11th grader at West Side, mm -hmm. how do we facilitate that? logistically. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of exciting things. That's uh, where that school band comes in. That's where that school band comes in. And when will, the, when will the zoo school be a slide? So we were, Go ahead. Well, so we were, yeah. I know so, we've been talking about yeah, this. So if, if the pandemic, yeah, if the pandemic had not hit, what would have happened for, for this school year 
is it would have been opened up to students from all the other high schools. We had everything ready to go. Pandemic shut us down. Still, the the the, the technical thing to work through with Hughes is does it remain as Hughes and other kids can go into it, which to be quite honest with you, with Emus and all the way that works, that's probably the best thing to do. If it separates from Hughes, then it has to have its own IRN number because it has to have an IRN number. So my goal would be to allow a, you know, a Woodward student, if they want to be in the Zoo Academy, they go to Woodward for half the day, they go to the Zoo Academy the other half. But the Zoo Academy is so beautiful because it's self-contained. I mean, they have a teacher there who is one of two people in the entire district who is duly certified as a high school teacher to teach English and math. Mm -hmm. And the Zoo Academy teachers teach the science slash agriculture courses. Um, so we definitely want that. And uh, but this year just got derailed because of, of COVID. But we had put a lot of effort into making it happen for this year. And then it, it just didn't. And part of that whole career thing would be some way to work out dual enrollment. I mean, we faced yeah. this during this pandemic thing, too. That if you can be duly enrolled oh, yeah. in two schools, then you've now taken care of that career opportunity right. too. Yeah. If it's legal. Yeah, well it is. Now I've already checked. With, okay. with career tech. With career tech, as long as a student is in their home school and like, well, it's happening right now. Well, with the, it with the, uh, yeah. It's happening right yeah. now with yeah. the program that uh, I was just mentioned about uh, child development associates. They are literally from you know two or three different schools, but they're all taking a course with a teacher who isn't part of any of those three schools. She has kids from all three schools. Mm -hmm. So it's perfectly legal to do. Right. It's the logistical piece. It's either got to be digital or we've got to transport students or both actually. I'm going to go buy more vans. <laughs> yeah, we need more vans. <laughs> yeah. And if there's a career specialist in every school, they can drive the van. Yeah, yeah, yeah so. <laughs> I'll wear purple every day. <laughs> well, then you might get it. Only get it. I will buy only purple. <laughs> I am happy to hear about that with Ava Free School. Uh, wow. For a short time. I went to Ava Free School. I, I, I won't say I'm a school, so I'm a owl. I, I know, you're an owl. Help me. The next item will take 30 seconds. Yes, ma'am. Um, so this is just a quick ACT update. Um, I have memo here. Justin is not here today, so I'm reporting on his behalf. But just to let you know, um, it is a, a law that um, juniors or third year uh, students must take the ACT or the SAT and it's state funded. Mm -hmm. um, we did get that test on February 23rd, had uh, students coming in. As of March 3rd, we have 64% of our students tested. Um, the makeup is on May, uh, March 9th. Um, and after that, ACT is usually, usually takes two to eight weeks to get the results. And then Justin will come back to get those results. And then we also listed here um, the ACT national testing dates uh, for you to have. So the makeup is for those who didn't have taken the test. Correct. But those are still the ones the district pays for. Correct. The only makeup, and then after that, it'll be individual waiver, whatever. whatever yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You said 68? 68%. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So we had we tested um, 1,348 kids. Do we know how the prep went for them in preparation? Um, I day? know. Uh, Josh Harden had something specific for okay. um, student yeah. athletes. We embedded um, prep in the curriculum. The curriculum. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. All right. We just make it interesting how that looks, with, you know, after COVID this year. I am just here at your pleasure. <laughs> Do you have any questions? I about have any? an other. You have an other? Well, I have an other too, uh, other updates. Do you have any questions for Chris regarding any type of communication and surveying? Just questions? that that New Shore Old Shore is a major kickoff yeah. of saving our district, getting us back in the winning column, so to speak. We're really excited about it. But that. I want a big map. I'm a visual person. Visual. 
And I think that people, that I, it's very impressive. But yeah, no, I'm good. And okay. can I, um, and maybe, Krista, being new to the district, this is where the magic happens really in SAC. And as far as the big, um, this is our core I business, really and that. just inviting you yeah, right. to join us so you can have the, all the things that I we do. And yeah. this is where it's happening. Everything else is quite internal. So you didn't have much to report on, but good thing you came. I know. Perfect. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> so, uh, one, uh, before you do your other business, I want to do an update regarding, I believe it was, um, who was it? Um, Ms. Kimmon and Ms. O'Brien. Do you all remember the two that you presented? Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I just want you to update because we had said we we're going to send that to, and the superintendent had a question for um, general counsel mm -hmm. uh, conflict, and then um, if we were in, even interested. But there was apparent, no apparent conflict. But but I don't believe that the the, the, the curriculum is interested in correct and moving on correct. with that at this particular time. Um, so what with purpose in the program? Maybe perhaps in the future or something. Yes. Yeah. Share with, mm -hmm. with uh, Dan. Okay. Yes. So I just want to give an update on that. No, thank you. And that's the other thing that happens in SAC more than anybody <laughs> else is you have to keep that that follow up, or it just becomes a one shot deal. Mm -hmm. It's easier. It's easier to track stuff in here. My 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 question is, and you mentioned it when you talked about because we brought in for ACT. As the board is facing this decision about in person being expanded or not expanded or whatever. It's come to my attention and slowly, unfortunately, about the fact that that we have to have all of our state tests yes. and all the AP tests have to be administered in person, in person with our proctors supervising and guaranteeing the integrity. Now, I know all about the AP piece. That's two and a half weeks, basically. And it's happening. I don't know if you do it in single places or you do it in a particular school, wherever the kids are, or you gather them. I don't know if you, I don't know how you do that. But those state tests, those are, I mean, what's the window? What's the schedule? We have a plan, and we have a day of, from transportation to um, working with our building tech coordinators, um, if you're be on that same mainframe or whatever, yeah, if you're in an A week, say or B week, so we have a calendar for all of that. I just think it would be really helpful for board members to see that schedule about that reality, because that reality could impact whether or not some board members, including myself, would would be voting in person or not in person. If you know what I mean. Because if we got to transfer, if they, the children have to be here, and they have to be here for all those tests, and the test lasts how many, you know, you have it marked out when it is, because it is all organized. They've got like transportation worked out and stuff. I just think it's it, it would be a valuable piece of information to know that how many days be in fourth quarter or whatever that is, the children have to be here as well for that. And I know we don't want to emphasize testing. It's taken us a long time not, you know, that's not the reason we're bringing children back. But at least for board members, it might help them understand that the kids are coming back in one way, shape, or form for the tests because the states, for, the state and the college boards are requiring it. And I don't know if that's 30 days. I don't know if it's four days for each grade or whatever. But I think that the chart would help help inform the board for that very big decision. In, in, in regards to testing, so when I think of the end of the end of the course test, is that when you're referencing that also? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, that's for the state test. Which test is the state not, we're taking them, but we're not being held really accountable. Right, for the, the high state part of it, like third grade guarantee, we have third to give the yes. air third grade, but we cannot retain kids based on the results of that test. But for end of course exams, and right now it's we're waiting to hear. Right now they are saying you go with the new measures for graduation. Right, it's in the house maybe. Um, they're discussing it right now, but right now we're held to the same standards for 2021 graduation. They are talking about 
I know it's late, yeah. but as far as the state making this decision, they are talking about um, giving the same consideration as last year's group. But as, as it stands right now, they have not made the decision. Our whole team from school leadership, teachers, counselors, um, principals, we have a plan for the more rigorous graduation requirement because we don't know how the vote is going to come out. And that's for the graduation points. As far as credit out of grades, how are our, how are our teachers determining passing? Because I know I'm talking about credit hours versus your points for your test. So credit out, we have a, a whole. But I'm saying, is anything different? And yes. Sure for instance, a lot of what we it's nothing different from the state, but what we have done differently because we're in a pandemic. Starting March first, we offered um, kind of credit recovery. Okay. Um, from uh, during after school hours. Yes. So the last time I reported, we were at 70% 70 percent on track. Now we're at 77 percent. So okay. we have specific things in place to help move our students forward. That it will also be a summer school. Um, but right now, we started something March 1st in helping our students meet those credit for graduation. And I'm right. referencing 9 for 11 teachers. And, and passing and things like that. Is there anything different that's happening? I'm hearing that there won't be anybody retained in our That's what I'm hearing. Well, that's well, well it's, it's right. And it's so that's based why on credit asking. hours. Well, I'm, right, but I'm thinking of the leniency that might be utilizing to say this. And I and I'm have concern, but I'm just saying what is some of the how are we monitoring that? As far as we we pull failure rate charts. Okay. That's what we gave. I sent you a memo on um you well, did. No, I thought it. I thought specifically, yes. um, and actually, it was better than okay. in, the, in right. the past. So we look at we pull failure rates um, as far as course courses kids are, are okay. taking, and I'm, try okay. to have. Um, we do graduation audits, um, and it's kid by kid, and looking at where they are and trying to fill those gaps and provide those supports. Okay. All right. I would just, I don't know, if, maybe it needs to be an assignment, but I, I would like to assign that the board receive the information about what this plan for all of the testing is. Mm -hmm. Yes. And how many days the kids would have to be here in person to do that. Right. I think, too, there's at least a few, this is a follow up to another public meeting just the other night. There's, there is still interest in, in looking at, and after, even though we did it in staff on the wallet test that there were so many kids that didn't pass the wallet test. Yeah. Do that you want a recommendation? We, I think you're going to hear from a couple of board members, not necessarily me, but a couple of board members, that those, those scores need to in some way be waived. I think you're going to hear that largely because other stuff is being waived. And it, it's being perceived in the community is that's how we're limiting the enrollment. Mm. And we already paid for that territory years ago of expanding the opportunities and, and changing the cut score. So I, I, I just I just would like to prepare you for that. But Thank definitely you. the board needs to know how many days anyway are all of our children have to be here. So that that would be actually an action. An action. An action. Yeah, we can't make assignments in this committee. We'll send, we'll send a memo. We'll okay. receive something from Mr. Leach, and I'll send a memo to the entire board. Okay. Now, if you could do that about Walnut, but also, but more particularly, the calendar of when the children have to be here in person anyway. Right. Well, for the Walnut, we're waiting until April because we expanded um, extended testing. Yeah. So we're looking at the data uh, to see how many kids mm -hmm. over the years are accepted um but if you would like a recommendation because we have been looking at national models of what to do and to be quite honest it, it, it states to look at um, your local norms we've been looking at national norms so if you look at your local norms and see who scored the highest um in within our district and um give access that yeah. way and that kind of it's across all schools mm -hmm. so we have research we have data um, on that, so I don't know if you're asking. Yeah, the local data would probably be more interesting. Yeah. I'm just saying you probably won't mm -hmm. have a, a majority of the board that will want to limit the incoming uh, seventh grade or whatever that is at Walnut 
by as many as it looks like we would be doing. Just so you're saying that you want the territory. But you're saying you want to finish the data. I we wanted to finish all the data. We can present and present it. And then so, for instance, if we typically get 400 kids in and we're at 300, there's 100 spots. Do we look at local norms to fill those 100 right. spots? Okay. And, and to do it too late, those people that didn't make it in may not be here. To make it in, so this is something where you have to kind of do that earlier than later because they're they're leaving the district. It's unfortunate, you know. You know me; I don't even like Walnut, but what are you going to do? I've never liked Walnut. <laughs> <laughs> Swoop. That's why I'm doing the Swoop. Swoop and Wyoming. I'm only thirty-six years competing with Walnut, so I'm, I have a lifelong hate for Walnut. <laughs> I'm proud as hell about it, but I don't like it. <laughs> All right, anything else? Good meeting. All right, very glad to see, um, but I enjoyed it. I uh, announced the meeting adjourned. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you, everybody.